All right, everybody, welcome to the next installment of our um, seminar. Uh, today, Carl Rankin is going to be speaking on uh, geometry and convexity of generated Jacobian equations, and uh, he's doing that from all the way in uh, sunny uh, Toronto. So oh. <laughs> take it away. Cool. Okay. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you for, for giving me this opportunity to talk. So the talk, as Paul said, is called Geometry and Convexity of Generated Jacobian Equations. Um, now, generated Jacobian equations are sort of my primary area of study to date. Uh, and they generalize the Monge-Ampere equation. And that's a PDE for which sort of a lot of really beautiful geometric techniques have been developed. Um, and the equation I study, the sort of name of the game is extending those techniques. But if I focused on the equation I study, the generated Jacobian equations, you'd lose a lot of the main ideas because we'd be focusing on technicalities. Um, so the reason I've, I've titled the talk Geometry, Geometry and Convexity is because that's what I'm going to focus on, those ideas um, in the context of the mon ampere equation, the simpler case. And then with whatever time is remaining, I'm going to talk about the actual generated Jacobian equations, um, some results and some basic techniques. So here's the outline. Uh, as stated, we're going to start with the mon ampere equation because that's where the ideas I want to talk about are clearest. Uh, so we'll do a quick intro to the mon ampere equation and then sort of a major result for the mon ampere equation that ties together the ideas I want to talk about today uh, is a result of Caffarelli's that you can sort of think of as an analog of the de Georgi Nash theorem. Uh, then once we've discussed that result and sort of the key ideas in the proof, we're going to talk about generated Jacobian equations. Uh, then we'll talk about some results for those equations. So let's get started on this introductory section um, that concerns mon ampere equations. So why are we discussing them? Um, it's because the PDEs we really want to discuss, generated Jacobian equations, generalize the mon ampere equations, uh, by which I mean the generated Jacobian equations we'll see eventually are a strict superset of the family of mon ampere equations. Uh, so let's go back a bit and start with the definition of elliptic PDE. So a second order partial differential equation, uh, which we can write in this form, it's just some function of our space variable u, du, and d squared u, uh, is called elliptic if it is monotone with respect to the Hessian. Um, and that's sort of with the usual ordering on symmetric matrices uh, in that one is greater than the other if the difference of those two has all non-negative eigenvalues. Um, and, and I've said monotone, usually we mean uh, strictly not, sorry, usually we mean non-decreasing, but of course up to a sign, they're the same thing. Now, the most basic example uh, of a second order elliptic partial differential equation is Laplace's equation, uh, which I've written here. And probably we've all seen it many times before, but it's just the sum of the repeated second order partial derivatives. And what we note is, is that's of course, the sum of the eigenvalues of the Hessian or the trace of the Hessian. So sort of on the other end of the nonlinearity spectrum is the mon ampere equation, uh, in which instead of prescribing the trace or the sum of the eigenvalues, we prescribe the determinant, which is to say the product of the eigenvalues. So the mon ampere equation is this one here. Uh, the determinant of d squared u is equal to some prescribed function f. And for this equation to be elliptic, then we need it to be, we need u to be convex. And I suppose you can see why this is. Um, if, let me write up in this top right corner, if we let lambda one through to lambda n, denote the eigenvalues of the Hessian. Then that d squared u is the product of them. And we see the requirement for this quantity to be monotone um, in each of those lambda i's is that they all have the same sign. So if we assume that sign is positive, uh, then your Hessian has positive eigenvalues, uh, which we know means you're convex. Just as for a, 
function of one variable if your second derivative is positive, your convex. Um, and in fact, this PDE was first studied in a geometric content, uh, context. So the early work uh, was done by Monge and Ampere, which is where it gets its name. Uh, that was you know, some 240 years ago now. Uh, then later work was done um, amongst you know, other authors, but some significant ones were Minkowski, Bernstein, Nirenberg, Alexandra, Pogorelov, and Caffarelli. Um, and we're going to start by talking about weak solutions of the mon equation. Now, some definition of a weak solution for, in particular, uh, elliptic, linear elliptic or linear, sorry, quasi-linear elliptic equations is usually taught in sort of an honors course. Uh, and when you learn that definition, you sort of, it can be motivated in one of two ways. Uh, First, you know, the linear structure lends itself well to integration by parts. So you can put a derivative on everything else. Um, or alternatively, if you look at the derivation of the PDE, so the actual physical derivations of Laplace's equation or the heat equation, uh, it usually involves some integral quantity that is generally exactly what we take in our definition of a weak solution. So in fact, the weak solution is, is physically almost just doing one step less in the derivation. Uh, but that linear structure isn't present for the mon ampere equation. So we wanna ask how we can define a notion of solution uh, that is still motivated in some sense by the context in which the PDE arises. Um, and, you know, of course you could just require you're in W2P for some P uh, so you've got second Sobolev derivatives and define it point-wise, but this isn't really reflective of the contexts in which the PDE arises. So we're going to introduce a definition of being a weak solution to the mon ampere equation as follows. We're going to assume you've got a convex solution of det d squared u equals f of x, so that's that first line. Um, and just as being a weak solution of a linear elliptic PDE, we test against any smooth function. Here, we're gonna test against any subset of the domain. So we're gonna take some arbitrary set, uh, E a subset of omega. Now, we remember a bit of multivariable calculus, uh, which is this line here, the change of variables formula. What it says is if you've got a mapping, um, you can get this formula for pretty much anything as low as Lipschitz. Um, but what it says is if you wanna, integrate a function over the image of that mapping as your domain. So this T of E down here. Uh, well, we can actually do that by integrating over our original domain and just evaluating the function composed with that mapping, provided we pick up uh, that Jacobian term, det dt. Now, if we apply it uh, to our solution of the mon ampere equation, well, what we do, we integrate uh, the function f over the set E by the PDE, that's equal to the integral of that d squared u over E. Uh, but then if we apply this change of variables formula with T equals du, then indeed det dt is det d squared u, and we've just got the, the uh, constant function h equals one. So the integral over E of det d squared u is equal to the integral of a function one over du of e, which is of course uh, the Lebesgue measure of du of e. And note, I lost those absolute values around d squared u because we've assumed convexity. So this quantity is non-negative. Um, so this provides a good definition of weak solution uh, in the sense that any solution satisfies it and in fact, if you're a C2 function satisfying this for every Borel E, a subset of omega, then you are a solution of the original equation. However, all, this, all we need to actually state uh, this requirement that the Lebesgue measure of du of E is equal to the integral of F over E is that U be C1. So we don't need C2, uh, and that's just like for weak solutions of linear equations. Uh, we only need one Sobolev derivative. But because we can do, because we're working with convex functions, we can do one better. 
So we can replace that uh, derivative with the subdifferential. So just a quick refresher on what the subdifferential is. Uh, we know a convex function has a supporting hyperplane at each point. The subdifferential is just the function which takes a point uh, and maps it to the set of all supporting hyperplanes. So here's that written properly. Um, the notation we use is this partial u of x naught, and it's the set of p such that p is the gradient of a supporting hyperplane. So as an actual example, you know, here's a convex function. Uh, it's equal to x squared for negative x, and it's equal to x for x greater than zero. The subdifferential at zero, it's the gradient of all those planes I've drawn in a dashed line. And what you can check is that, well, Certainly uh, the flat line, so the line with gradient zero is a support, and so is everything with gradient up to one. So this one here. Uh, and what that means is the subdifferential is the closed interval zero to one. Um, and everywhere where you're differentiable, the subgradient is just the singleton set containing the U. So if we use this uh, in place of du, we, we're gonna have the following definition for a weak solution of the mon Ampere equation. So a convex function u mapping omega to r uh, is called an Alexandrov solution because it was, a, I think Alexandrov who wrote this down first, but I could be wrong on that. Um, it's called an Alexandrov solution of det d squared u equals f of x, provided for every Borel e, a subset of omega. Uh, we have this same identity as before but with the sub-differential as opposed to the derivative. Uh, and one thing I wanna note is if we have estimates for our function f uh, in the sense that it's bounded above and below by positive constants, then an Alexandrov solution satisfies this estimate here. Um, the sub-differential has Lebesgue measure sort of pinched between the corresponding measure of a set in the space. Um, and the reason that's important is we're, is we're going to talk about now the links um, between the mon Ampere equation and Gauss curvature. And this is sort of what Alexandrov studied. Um, I want to recall Gauss's definition of, of curvature. So I, I, my geometry is rather poor, but I think, you know, these days, often the first definition you see of the Gauss curvature is just sort of in terms of these differential quantities. Um, the, the curvatures. But Gauss's one was a bit more geometric. Uh, we take an oriented surface. So I suppose it could be half of a hemisphere. Well, a hemisphere. Um, and we consider the normal at each point. Then we're going to define the curvature at this point. We consider small sets containing our point. And we consider the set of all normals. Um, that sort of has a n minus one dimensional Hausdorff volume, and we compare it to the corresponding volume of A. And we take some suitable limit as A decreases to zero, uh, and that's how we're going to define the curvature. And I've written down here to sort of compare with the fact that balls have constant curvature. Um, and that's because basically, think of the unit ball. The normal is just the point, uh, modular identification. So of course, uh, this quantity here is constant over the ball. Now, in the special case that M is a graph, we can actually write down what the normal is. Um, it's du of x with a vertical component and then normalized. So what we get is if we assume uh, a priori, we've got some bound on du, that, so it's not too big. Then the volume of n of e is proportional to the volume of du of e, uh, because, well, our n, once we, you know, factor out a constant, i.e. assume the denominator is constant for the sake of this argument, um, then the volume of n applied to a set of the image of a set under N is proportional to the volume of du of E. So we can say the Gauss curvature is also proportional to the limit of these. So if we have 
our Alexandrov, our, our definition of Alexandrov solution, which we recall looked something like following du of a in volume is pinched between two constants. Uh, then it's pretty clear that that definition of Alexandrov solution is going to turn into curvature estimates. Um, because when you divide through by the volume of A, then that quantity K of X is bounded above and below. So one very geometric way of thinking uh, of what it means to be an Alexandrov solution is that they're sort of an integrated version of Gauss curvature estimates. Um, so that's motivated our definition of weak solution to the Mont Jampier equation. Now we're going to talk about one of the central results in the theory. And what I want to stress as we go through this result is that the key ideas are all based on convexity uh, and considering images of the subdifferential. We never really work with the PDE in the form det d squared u. Uh, and necessarily we can't because we haven't actually assumed that quantity exists. So we're going to be talking about Caffarelli's analog of the DeGiorgi Nash theorem. Uh, so we recall what this DeGiorgi Nash result says. Uh, if u is a weak solution in W12 of this divergence form elliptic equation, where the only thing we require on those coefficients is that they're measurable uh, and are sort of pinched positively in the matrix sense, uh, i.e. your PDE is uniformly elliptic, then your weak solution u is in C alpha. And the context in which this result was originally considered and you know, in which it's usually used is our function u is not just a function u. It's usually actually the derivatives uh, of a minimizer of a variational integral. So usually we're applying this result to derivatives. Uh, a C alpha result for derivatives is actually a C1 alpha result for the function we're interested in. And we're gonna look at an analog for the Mon Jampier equation. Uh, so a C1 alpha result for the Mon Jampier equation. So the result is the following. It's due to Caffarelli. We're gonna let U be a strictly convex Alexandrov solution of a lambda less than or equal to d squared U, less than or equal to big lambda. So this is, this is very reminiscent of the previous result. All we're requiring is a positive pinching, uh, no regularity on d squared U. Uh, then the conclusion is U is C1 alpha. So it looks a lot like the previous result. Um, let me read this slide a bit out of order. What I'm gonna emphasize first is that this strict convexity I've required is non-trivial. Uh, there, there's examples where if you lose the strict convexity, you lose the C1 alpha. Uh, and where we usually get the C1 alpha, sorry, the strict convexity from is a suitable boundary condition. And that's, that's pretty much necessary because the mont Ampere equation is degenerate elliptic. Um, we're gonna look at, a slightly simpler case, just because of the interest of time, we're going to look at C1 differentiability. Uh, we're going to use some ideas from Caffarelli's work, but also just a really nice uh, survey article by Jacqueline Liu and Zhu Xiaowei. So here's our first key lemma for this result. Uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll read it out. We're going to assume we've got an open convex set and U is a convex solution of lambda less than or equal to depth E squared U, uh, less than big lambda, and u is equal to zero on the boundary. Then there is constants c of n lambda, uh, little c, big C, such that the supremum of u is pinched. So here's the picture. We're considering you know, our Alexandrov solution. And what we know is that the supremum of the absolute value, i.e. how far it drops down, is pinched between two positive constants, uh, depending on the size of the domain. So let's look at the proof. And this is where we really start to get, see some of these sort of convexity ideas popping up. So first I wanna reduce my domain omega to a much nicer set to work on. We're gonna use a lemma of, of Fritz Johns from uh, quite some time ago. 
And what it says is that for any bounded convex set, so you know, perhaps we've got this set, there's an affine transformation such that after you apply it, your convex set is actually pinched between the balls uh, of radius one on N and radius one. So it's, it's sort of a rigidity result for bounded open convex sets. Uh, we can always trap them in between two balls of sort of very controlled radii. Uh, what do I wanna say about this result? I wanna say that once we've applied this mapping T by computing the volumes of each quantity uh, in that subset relation, we can actually get up to constants an estimate for debt T. So the volume of T omega uh, is just omega times debt T, where for an affine transformation, I use debt T to just mean the determinant of the linear part. Um, that's pinched between constants depending on N. And so what we see is that up to a constant, uh, a dimensional constant, but also one in, later in the proof, but not yet, depending on lambda and lambda, uh, we have the determinant of T is basically omega minus one. What this means is if I prove the lemma for this new function, V of Y defined in this way, uh, then I'll obtain the result for you. So the reason I can prove the result for this V is because we check uh, DV, is we've still got this debt T out the front. Then we've got a T minus one times DU. So D squared V, we've still got that debt T. Uh, and then we've got T minus one, D squared U, T minus one. So when we compute debt D squared V, well, that debt t to the two on n just becomes a debt t squared. Um, determinants from those two t inverses cancel with it and we get debt d squared u. So it's an Alexandrov solution of the same inequality. Um, now though, on, on a domain contained in the ball of radius one and containing the ball of radius one on n. So we don't need our omegas when we prove the estimate for V, uh, but they'll drop out when we go back to U because the sup of V to the N is equal to debt T squared times sup of U to the N, uh, which by what we've got above is proportional to omega to the minus one. So we can just consider this function, uh, this proof for a function defined on what we call a normalized convex domain. And by convexity, all we're gonna estimate is U at the origin. So the way we're gonna do that, uh, here's the setting. We've got our nice domain omega contained uh, in the ball of radius one and containing the ball of radius one on it. We're gonna take our function u and we're gonna put a, a convex cone at u of zero uh, with base B1. So it's equal to zero on the boundary of the ball. Now, what we can say about this cone is first that its subdifferential is a subset of the subdifferential of U. And this has a intuitive proof. We take a subdifferential of the cone and we just shift it down until it becomes a subdifferential of U. Um, and we can also say that the subdifferential of the con cone contains a ball of radius uh, absolute value U of zero. The reason for this is, well, it's just rise over run. Uh, consider the cone and this gradient here, its rise is absolute value U of zero. Its run is one because that's the point zero and this is the ball of radius one. So the gradient there uh, is equal to U of zero. And we can do that in any direction. So once we've got that, Of differential of the cone contains the ball of radius u of zero and is contained in partial u of omega. Uh, we just string these together as follows. So 
by our ball containment condition, we get this first inequality. Then by the containment condition uh, that the subdifferential is contained in partial U of omega, we get this one. And finally, our assumption of being an Alexandrov solution gives us this final bound, which is what we wanted. Okay, now remember we need an inequality in the other direction. Uh, this one is, is actually just slightly quicker. So what we're gonna do is, is again, we're gonna consider our function. And now we're gonna consider it in B1 on 2N. So let's say that's B1 on 2N. And this is B1 on N here. Then everywhere in B1 on 2N, we have a gradient estimate. Um, it's just some dimensional constant times the super view. So this value here. And the reason is because if we didn't have such an estimate, then we have a gradient that is extremely steep. Uh, and that will contradict that u is equal to zero on the boundary of omega because a convex function with a steep gradient over a set of fixed size, here size, one on two to the n um, necessarily grows quite severely. So we've got some control. In the ball of radius one on two n, our gradient satisfies an estimate of this form. So what that means is the subdifferential of partial u of b one on two n uh, is less than some constant times sup u to the n. So that's just because it's contained in a ball of radius sup u. Uh, up to a constant. And then again, we use that we're an Alexandrov solution. So in fact, the subdifferential must be bounded below. Um, and if we combine these, then what we get is partial u of b1 on 2n is less than or equal to some constant times sup u to the n and bounded below by again, some constant, uh, you can write it explicitly, times lambda. So that's kind of a slick proof. Um, these proofs here are from, from the survey by Zuzha and Jacqueline, and, and they really are quite slick. So we wanna strengthen our earlier estimate. So remember what we said, uh, the estimate we were trying to prove, this one is just control on the soup but we don't know if maybe it drops down almost immediately to the soup from the boundary. Uh, this next estimate is gonna say, actually that can't happen. And I'm, I'm not gonna give a proof for this next estimate, uh, but what it is, is when we've got our convex set and we've got U close to the boundary in a particular way, then we can control U in a stronger way. So, yeah, the full setup, we've got our open convex set again, we've got our Alexandrov solution, which is equal to zero on the boundary. Uh, and the conclusion is if X is a point close to the boundary, so I've initially written close in one direction sufficiently far in the other, I'll explain that in a second. Um, then we have our original estimate strengthened by a factor of uh, your distance to the boundary. So that controls how steeply you can drop down and how quickly. And the actual condition, what I mean by sufficiently far in the other direction is it doesn't just depend on the distance from X to partial omega. What it depends on is we need two supporting hyperplanes. We get to choose them. And it depends on the ratio of X's distance to one hyperplane versus a distance to the other. So sufficiently far in the other direction means we can disregard that factor in the denominator. Um, and as I said, I'm not gonna prove this one, but again, the main ideas are a convexity. You take a suitable cone like before, but now you've got an estimate, um, a stronger estimate for the cone by the fact that the cone has vertex close to the boundary. So let's look at how these combine to prove our C1 result. And, and it's really 
remarkable how quickly this C1 result drops out um, with those lemmas. So what we're going to do is take a strictly convex solution of this Alexander of inequality. Um, and we're going to suppose it's not C1. Not C1 at some point x naught, which without loss of generality, we can assume uh, is equal to zero. And then we're going to make a couple more assumptions. So we get the following picture. What we're going to assume is that in fact, this x naught is equal to zero. That u is equal to zero at that point um, and greater than zero everywhere else. And finally, our assumption that you're not C1 means your subdifferential contains at least a line segment. So you have to have more than one subgradient at that point. Um, but what we can do by adding or subtracting an appropriate hyperplane or supporting function um, is assume that in fact your subdifferential is of the following form. It contains a line segment of the form TE1, where E1 is just our first basis vector. So it looks like a, there's one subdifferential and it contains all of them up to some A. And then additionally, it's contained in the set of uh, X such that X1 is greater than zero. So at zero, we don't have any planes with a negative gradient in the X1 direction. And what we're going to consider is what's called a section, family of sections. We just consider the convex set omega h, which is defined as the set where u is less than h. So uh, it's, it's, yeah, here's our line h. And we're going to shift this line down. So by our assumption that the subdifferential contains te1, then u of x is greater than ax1. So that's this uh, linear rise here. Now that means zero is a distance less than or equal to h on a from the boundary. So we can just compute when the line t, uh, sorry, ax1 is equal to h for x1 equal h on a. So the distance to the boundary has to be less than h on a. So what our second Alexandrov estimate tells us is that h to the n, which is uh, the value of u of zero, um, sorry, I suppose you need to subtract h from u of zero to have the estimate written in this way, or you can just consider the Alexandrov estimates with u equal to h on the boundary. Um, that's, that's rather inconsequential. But what it tells us is that h to the n, which is the value of, uh, which is the supremum of boundary value plane minus u to the nth power is less than or equal to the size of omega h squared uh, and the distance from x to the boundary. So that is c h on a times omega h squared. Uh, on the other hand, we know that this supremum is controlled below by omega h. That was our first Alexander estimate. So we, we combine them. We just take this one. We just take this second estimate, chain it together there. And what we get is up to a constant, we have a hn term is less than or equal to a hn plus one term. It's a contradiction for H sufficiently small. Uh, and the estimate sort of drops out that quickly. Which, you know, this is a significant result. So the reason the estimate drops out so quickly is because of how strong those Alexandrov estimates are. They really are sort of bedrock results for the mont Jampier equation. Um, and, you know, we didn't use the mont Jampier equation as such, the, the actual quantity involved in the second derivatives anywhere. We just did estimates based on convexity ideas. And we're gonna talk about generated Jacobian equations now, which are a whole new family of PDE that let you 
you know, use the same sort of really nice convexity arguments. So I'm going to talk about these new PDEs, geometric optic equations, uh, in the context of geometric optics, but they also arise in optimal transport. And, and that's probably actually been a more significant driving force for a simpler case of these PDEs. So in the field of geometric optics, uh, we have equations of the following form. Depth dy for some vector valued mapping y, which we will define, uh, is prescribed. Uh, and you know, the key inclusion is before we just had, for the Monge Ampere equation, we had, sorry, y of x u du is just equal to du. Now we've got this, this far more complicated quantity. Um, so these equations were sort of first studied by Neil Schrodinger in the full generality we're going to approach today. Um, but he built on ideas from the optimal transport case. And in both of those cases, uh, Neil's work and the optimal transport case, the whole goal is to work in a framework that's similar enough to Monge Ampere equations that you can use the same ideas, but treat the new problems. Um, and one other application in which these generated Jacobian equations have arrived is uh, certain problems known as monopolist problems in economics. So let's do a quick uh, derivation of how these equations might arise in geometric optics. So the setting for geometric optics is basically the following. We're going to take two domains, omega and omega star in Rn, and on each of these, we're going to have prescribed densities. So uh, commonly denoted F and F star. And what these represent is basically the intensities of light rays leaving a source, uh, that's F, and F star is a desired intensity on the target domain. So our goal is to create a reflector, uh, which we're going to model by a function u, such that the light rays hit it, and they bounce back into omega star with the required density. Um, the other sort of key problem in geometric optics is instead of reflectors, you def define lenses. But what we're going to consider is if we have some ray which starts at x uh, and ends up at some point y, then it's where it ends up, this function y of x, is actually going to depend on a couple of things. First, where x starts. Obviously, uh, if it starts somewhere else, say here, we're going to hit somewhere else entirely. Um, it's also going to de depend on the height of our reflector. So if u was higher, then obviously we'd go further. We'd hit at a different point. And finally, by Snell's law, where you end up also depends on the gradient at that point. So our ray tracing map depends on y of x, u, and du. And what conservation of energy says is that the sort of total intensity you start with in, a given sub in any given subset, e a subset of omega, um, the intensity is the integral of the density. Well, that has to be equal to what you end up with, which is this image uh, under this mapping, which I also just denote by yu, yu of e, of your new intensity. So that's what energy conservation tells us. For every set e, uh, we have that the integral of your original density f over e is equal to the integral of your target density f star over the image of E under the ray tracing map. And I mean, that looks a lot like our definition of Alexandrov's solution to the Mongean-Pierre equation. Um, and we can go further by using the change of variables formula. So for now, we're just assuming that Y is reasonable enough that we can do that. But if you do, then the change of variables formula applied as above, integrate over a set E, the function F, um, you get this quantity, then apply the change of variables formula with the mapping YU, you're going to get this, which up to sort of a point wise, you know, if this holds for every set and your functions are sufficiently smooth, it holds point wise. And that's where our actual generated Jacobian equation comes from. So, what we need to do now, now that we know these problems lead to PDEs with this basic form, 
um, is actually work out what functions you and why both arise in applications uh, and lead to a reasonable theory, you know, allow us to actually have reasonable tools to study these equations. So the way we do that is by building up this new convexity theory. And the way we start that new convexity theory is with a new notion of support. So as I mentioned before, convex functions are ones with a supporting hyperplane at each point. Uh, that is, you can hit it with a function of this form, g of x, y, z equals x dot y minus z at each point. Now we're going to consider new support functions. So we're going to consider, you know, possibly more wacky functions, but they'll have the property that for a particular class of g, you can always hit them below. So let's introduce those functions g. They're called a generating function. Um, and it's a function defined on some domain gamma satisfying the following properties. And let me explain which of these are important and which are just technical. So this A naught, uh, it's a C4 condition and it's some nice conditions on the domain. These are just, you know, what we need to make the proofs work. However, this next condition A1 is a little more essential. It says for each XUP in this set, which consists of all points of the form X, our function G evaluated at X, Y, Z, uh, and its derivative of, in the x variable evaluated at x, y, z. Well, for every point in that set, uh, there's actually a unique, so only one x, y, z corresponding to the values u and p. And why this one is important is when we introduce this notion of g convexity, it's saying that there's actually exactly one value of x, y, z, such that we can hit with the right gradient. Um, and then we've got some other conditions that are essential. So A1 star, it's sort of a dual condition. Um, it's another injectivity condition. And after some suitable transformations, it's the exact same as A1, uh, but applied to the dual generating function, which is an analog of the Legendre transform. Uh, then we've got this condition that g sub z has to have derivative less than zero. Uh, sorry, g sub z is less than zero. That just means we can shift our g functions up and down by varying that z variable. Uh, and then we've got a particular non-degeneracy condition. This odd looking combination of derivatives has to be non-zero. So with our generating function, we can define a g convex function. So a function, uh, on a domain omega is called G convex, basically just provided for each X naught, there exists some choice of Y naught and Z naught such that G of X, Y naught, Z naught hits it from below. And we can define a mapping um, which actually takes this point X naught and this value here u of x naught du of x naught to the corresponding yz. So this is an analog of the subdifferential because it's telling us uh, what sort of g gradient our generating function needs to be a support. And with this, we can define generated Jacobian equations. So a partial differential equation of this form, uh, det dy u du is equal to some prescribed function of lower derivative is called a generated Jacobian equation, provided the mapping y uh, derives from solving six and 11. Something's a little off with our equation numbering, uh, but provided it comes from solving these two. Um, and with a little bit of sort of basic arithmetic, you can turn that into a mon Jampier equation. Um, so in fact, generated Jacobian equations can be rewritten as these mon pierre type equations, which are the determinant of the Hessian minus some what's known as an augmenting matrix um, is prescribed. So the definition of weak solution, it's an exact analog of what we had for mon pierre equations. Um, we just apply integrate, uh, not integration by parts, we apply the change of variables formula 
and we say a weak solution, a, func a G convex function U is a Alexandrov solution of the generated Jacobian equation, provided uh, this equality holds for every E a subset of omega. So I'm not dwelling too much on this slide because we went over it in a bit of detail in the Monjan Peer equation case. And we also basically saw the derivation again when we considered the geometric optics. Um, now there's one other condition we need on the generating function. And it's kind of a behemoth of a condition. It's called A3W. Um, it's also called the ma trudinger wang condition uh, after Zinan Ma, Neil Trudinger, and Zhu Zha Wang, who sort of discovered this condition in the optimal transport setting in 2005. And I won't say too much about its analytic formulations just because it's a mouthful. But what I will say is this condition is what gives you that your convexity theory induced by the generating function is similar to the convexity theory in the normal case. Uh, so this condition gives us results like the, sub, the G sub differential, that Y mapping is convex or sections, which are what you get when you take a G convex function and lift up the support and consider the set where it's less than the support. Well, these are also the correct analog of convex uh, if and only if you have this A3W condition. So here are some examples. Uh, we've got the Monjan Peer equation. That's the one we started with. It's just induced by G equals X dot Y minus Z. Um, then we've got what happens in optimal transport. There you've got sort of arbitrary X, Y dependence, but your Z is still just subtracted off. Then generating uh, generated Jacobian equations in their full generality, you can consider much more complicated Z equations or Z dependence. And it leads to these sort of horrendous looking PDEs and sort of the real miracle of generated Jacobian equations. And, and this is, you know, the theory introduced by Neil is that you can study equations that look like this with ideas as nice as those for the Monjampier equation. Um, and, and that little spiel is, is what's on this slide. So what's important about this setup is it lets us prove results using the ideas from the Monjan pure equation case. Um, and I think I'll just talk about a couple of those results um, to finish up with. So I'll talk about the analog of the C1 alpha result. So now we're going to assume you uh, is such that your generating function satisfies A3W, omega, your two domains, omega and omega star, are sort of a G convex analog of convex. So that's a convexity condition on your domains. Uh, and U is an Alexandrov solution, a weak solution of this generated Jacobian equation. So an arbitrary Y mapping here. Then with an appropriate boundary condition, that's a direct analog of the Monjampier equation, um, of the second boundary value problem for the Monjampier equation, then you get that in fact your function u is strictly g convex and c1 alpha. And so this result, uh, we've already said it was due to Caffarelli for the Monjampier equation case. Then in the optimal transport case, um, it's due to a number of people. Uh, sort of the first one I know of is due to uh, Figali, Kim, and McCann in 2013. Then under sort of different convexity conditions on the domain, it was proved by Gillen and Kitagawa, uh, Vaitoa and Shiming Chen and Zhu Zhawai. And then finally in the generated Jacobian equation, again, it's been proved more than once under different boundary conditions. Um, first by Gillen and Kitagawa. And then I suppose, you know, this is where I plug my work. Uh, I've got a recent preprint up on the archive where I prove this result under the analog of Zuja and Shibing's conditions, which are sort of the most general conditions on the domain. Um, now, I, I do have a whole bunch of other results that I could talk about, but the take home message is just, our setup is strong enough that you get the results you had for the Monjampier equation. 
um, in both the optimal transport and this really new abstract setting of generated Jacobian equations. Um, but I think I'll stop there. I won't just list results. So I think I'll stop there and I'll see if anyone has questions. No, excellent. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, does anyone yeah, want to kick off some, with some questions? Right. Can I ask? Um, so in a sense, this this G convexity, you're kind of replacing um, affine hyperplanes with some other kind of hypersurface, yeah. I guess. Yeah. That's exactly right. Is, is, uh, does this come about from, you know, are they like kind of with some suitable Romanian metric, totally geodesic kind of things or something? So, um, so in hyperbolic space, you can replace kind of, you know, this horospherical convexity where sort of the, the analog of your hyperplanes is these horospheres. Um, I wonder if that's kind of the same thing that's going on here or whether this is more general. So are you asking if the Gs themselves, the analog of the hyperplane, what we're replacing the hyperplane with are totally yeah. geodesic? Something like that, yeah. Well, I don't really know the answer to that because we, I, yeah. I, I would say there's been no real study of uh, the Gs from a sort of intrinsic viewpoint. We really are right. just considering them as supports of functions in RN. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and they're pretty much. So, always, I mean, it, it, it would be totally geodesic with respect to some suitable choice of uh, Romanian metric. It would not the Euclidean one, of course, because it's not going to work. But yeah. Yeah. I would trust your judgment on that, but don't know enough to confirm yeah, or okay. deny. Yeah. 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 I just wonder sometimes some of these things can be rephrased as, a, as the exact same problem, but just instead of using the Euclidean metric with some, so it becomes a Monger. Type Monge pair type problem with uh, in a suitable Romanian manifold kind of thing. Yeah. No. Okay. That that is an interesting point because I, I I spent a bit of time trying to work out if I could just turn these things into a Monge right. pair equation over the right hypersurface. Um, uh -huh. I didn't get anywhere, but I also didn't get a definitive no. Yeah. Okay. Do you know what they look like in the case of the optimal transport? I mean, sorry, the the geometric optics setup. Uh, the G's what themselves. Yeah. 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 So uh, one example that sort of is, you know, just one written from. Uh, from oh, the G's there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Applications is this G. And, and I suppose I was going to plug some other people's work on the last slide. Um, hmm. So someone, a, a PhD student in the Netherlands, I think, has a PhD thesis that is basically just filled with these Gs for particular geometric optics examples. So I, I, that, I found that really comforting that someone who was, a, a, I don't know, a geometric optician actually wanted to use these ideas. It wasn't just, you know, us saying we're doing applied maths, but no one actually using it. Sort of curious if you, uh, one of the situations which might turn up naturally in geometric optics is you have some attenuation. So you don't preserve the intensity in the same sense, but your intensity will drop off like, you know, whatever it is, exponential with distance or something. Do you know, yeah. have any idea whether that be formulated in this setup? And That hasn't been done yet um, because sort of our basic assumption for the derivation of these equations are, was right, that sort of energy conservation. conservation. Yeah. I, I suppose, you know, a, a naive thing you'd do is, uh, where's our actual derivation? You know, you could just replace the conservation of energy with, you know, your loss of energy. So. Right, whether you can write that in a similar way, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but. I, 
I don't really see an easy way of doing that in this framework. Yeah. Yeah. Just curious. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, although sort of the, the other end of the spectrum is, is when you're doing maybe the exact opposite of what you've said, which is con considering, you know, infinitely far problems with no loss of energy, then you're actually back in the optimal transport case. You don't need this oh, yeah. general setup. So this um, this approach, uh, looking at so even back in the Mons Ampere subdifferentials and so forth, um, is this kind of I mean just another way of looking at a viscosity type solution in a sense? I mean you don't have the integrated kind of uh, equalities anymore, but you can sort of think about um, it's not doesn't give you the same thing or yeah yeah or what's the there, connection? No, there is um results that give you conditions of when Alexandrov solutions are viscosity solutions viscosity, and vice right. versa. Um, and counter examples when they're not? Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, the, the work I've seen on viscosity solutions for mon Jampier equations, which is definitely not all of it, usually tries to get to you are an Alexander of solution because they're the sort of nicer ones to work with. Right, right, okay, right. Yeah. No, it's it's a viscosities are for all fully nonlinear elliptic PDE. These are well adapted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So you sort of uh, you can get kind of uh, well stronger results. I suppose you can you can prove this. C1 alpha regularity, say for example, uh, yeah. using these techniques, which then if you had a, just a general viscosity, then you don't yeah. have that extra structure anymore. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Cool. Yeah. And does anyone else uh, have any other questions? Awesome. All right, cool. All right, thank you very, Thanks, very uh, informative nice talk. talk. Yeah, yeah, Thanks, very nice. Yeah, yeah, that's a cool way of doing things. So, um, yeah, yeah, thank yeah. You. it's like, a, <laughs> you know, I, I could talk about my results for the whole talk, but I like Caffarelli's results more, so I'd rather yeah. talk about yeah. them. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Just yeah, well, it's always nice to write down a nasty looking PD and say you can, uh, you can solve it using some clever idea, so. <laughs> Whereas if you just looked at it directly, you think, what am I supposed to do with this uh, mess? So, yeah, very yeah good. absolutely. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah, See you all later. Again. Thanks, guys. Thanks.